Welcome back to Online Darts, everyone. We're here in Cardiff for the start of the Premier League, and we get a chance to catch up with Matt Porter again. Matt, before we get on to the Premier League, everyone like that, wow, what a roller coaster darts has been on for the last two months. It's been an amazing, amazing short period of time, hasn't it? Well, a short period of time that's felt like a long period of time, yeah. I mean, I think just off the back of the most sensational story generating world championship we've ever had, um, which, which attracted interest from parts of the media, parts of the public, parts of the world that we hadn't had before, um, to go straight into a fantastic month of, of World Series action. It's been it's been an absolute roller coaster. World Championship, obviously, I know Luke Humphreys won it, and we'll come on to in a minute. But mm. there was only one Luke on everyone's mm. lips right now, and, and that's yeah. the now 17-year-old yeah, yeah, Luke. Yeah, Little. I know yeah, we yeah. spoke before the World Championships, and you mm. were like, look let's not pile pressure on him, but did sure. that become very hard not to with what he was doing? Yeah, I don't think it piled pressure on him. I think it, I think it, it generated its own story. I don't think anybody was uh, watching him going into matches, expect, you know, thinking, oh, this kid's, this kid's got to win, in, in that respect of pressure. Yeah. You know, they might watch Michael Van Gerwen or Michael Smith or Gerwin Price or Peter Wright or whoever and say, well, they've got to win because of their status within the game. But Luke Littler didn't have any status within the game. He was just a, a kid off the development tour who was playing well in every match. So if he'd have turned up one day and thrown an 85 average and, and lost, everyone would have just gone, oh, OK, well, that was good while it lasted. But it, but it didn't happen. You know, he, he, his performances were consistent. His composure was, was immaculate. The way he dealt with everything around him was, was showing maturity beyond his years. And the story just grew and grew. Um, you know, it, 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 it took over the tournament. When did he come into Premier League contention? Because obviously, at that age, there's a lot that goes into mm. that decision. When did it become a serious possibility? Um, once he would got into the quarter-final stages was the first time we actually had a conversation other than, oh, well, we can't put him in the Premier League. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because previously it was, uh, you know, well, this is nice, isn't he good? <laughs> you know, and then it was, oh, actually, he's really good. Yeah. Oh, no, he's really, really good, you know. But he, he, he I think it's... It, as, as quickly as it became a conversation, it stopped being a conversation because there wasn't a decision to make. Yeah. You know, once he'd, once he'd achieved what he'd achieved, there was no way in the sane world that you could have not put him in the Premier League. And, and once he'd said he wanted to play in it, I don't think it had really crossed his mind either. I think he was asked about it quite early in the tournament in one of his press conferences and sort of brushed it off. I don't think it was something he was thinking about in the slightest, but it quickly became a, a fait accompli. Because of his age, was there issues that you had to look into regarding safeguarding and everything like that, or yeah, was it not? We've really? always had a safeguarding policy. You know, we, we've we've got um, you know we obviously have a duty of care with with minors in particular, and we've got a policy in place. We've obviously run the development tour for many years. We've got a relationship with the JDC. We're u we're used to underage dart players, you know, because th that's part of our structure. Um, but we've been used to them in a different part of the game. Clearly, now he's crossing over into a, into a different environment. Um, and I think it was Michael Van Gerwen who referenced it earlier on in, in today's press conference. He's playing with the big boys now. So, you know, as much as he needs that level of protection that you, that you legally and morally would give to a minor, he's also in that big boys league where he's playing for, for hundreds of thousands of pounds. So, um, you know, he, he's, he's, he's ready for that environment and, and it's going to be fascinating to see how he copes with it. The numbers generated from the semi-final and then the jump to the final, was it 4.8 million mm. in, in the end? That's astronomical you yeah. must be delighted with the way yeah. it's transpired and transcended to the public i mean if you if you just put it in context the single biggest watched non-football event in the history of sky sports so forget the Ryder cup forget the masters golf forget the ashes cricket forget anything they've shown from any other sport this attracted not just more viewers loads more viewers it wasn't even close you know it smashed it out of the water um, and I think the, the tournament was building in, in to, to record-breaking numbers anyway. We noticed very early on when we, we, we get overnight viewing figures through and we obviously relate them to previous years and, and other tournaments and things like that and the trends were very, very strong very early anyway. But then the growth towards those, over the, those last few days just knocked our socks off. Obviously, you touched on Luke there. <coughs> How has he crossed boundaries that no other player has crossed. We've seen some of the media outlets that were turning up to Alexandra Palace and, and afterwards some of the things that are happening. This is mm. like icon, sports star yeah, level. It, it is. I think if you look at um, the Fallon story from three or four years ago, that was probably the, the, the last time that we managed to hit 
certain parts of the media that wouldn't otherwise talk about darts. Um, you know, we always get very strong coverage in the sports pages and, and, and over Christmas in, in the kind of general entertainment media because the country gets <coughs> captivated by the World Darts Championship at Christmas anyway. Um, but this was attracting a lot more lifestyle media, a lot more women's interest media, a lot more youth interest media. Um, and it, it was, yeah, it was opening new, new doors for us. Not taking away from Luke Humphries, he went in as the, as the mm. tournament favourite and lived up to that billing, winning Absolutely. four of the last five TV, yeah, yeah, TV yeah. tournaments. Just an incredible story from yeah, Luke. I, I think possibly, if you look at it historically in the, in the history of the PDC, it's, pro it's possibly the strongest run of form any player's ever delivered in, in, in terms of tournaments of that, of that status in that period of time. You know, what, what Luke Humphries has achieved. And, and actually, the Luke Littler story exists without just talking about darts as well. But when you talk about the darts, then the story is Luke Humphreys because his form over the second half of last year. I think he, he came out with a line where he said he, he thinks he, he played in every session of darts available to him because even when he lost it uh, uh, over that period, because even when he lost in the European Championship, he lost in the, the finals, the Sunday yeah. evening session. Yeah. So, you know, he, he's played a huge amount. His, his composure and his experience in that, crucial stage of tournaments is obviously now absolutely nailed on elite level um, and I think when we look back to 12 months ago when, when he wasn't selected for the Premier League I remember the conversation I had with him where I said look despite the progress you've made this year I still think you really need to go out there and prove it on the biggest stages of all and, and he hadn't done that up to that time but he, 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 he was very constructive about it and, and, and I think, you know, I'm sure you've asked him, but I think he, he knows now that the experience he's had over the last 12 months that has benefited him rather than had he been thrown into the Premier League too early, it may have harmed him. Oh, you know, yeah, he's, he's open, he's, he said he was disappointed at the time, but mm. now he understands the, the, the process yeah, yeah, yeah. behind it. Moving in to, to the new year, it's kicked off with, with a bang of a two yeah, yeah, World yeah. Series events. First of all, early feedback from those two, has that been good? Very good, yeah. I mean, back when we saw huge crowds compared to the previous year, you know, obviously in year one, it's, it's difficult sometimes to get, to get um, you know, wide public interest, but the crowds this year were really, really strong. I think, obviously, the fact it came off the World Championship straight away helped as well. And Den Bosch was a really memorable weekend. You know, I thought it was fantastic for Michael Van Gogh to win in front of his home crowd, um, you know, it, it was just a, a very nice romantic story for him, for him to do that, and, and I think those two tournaments have really teed up. You know, what's the start of of, of a, a big year for us? Did Marco Van Gogh need that win because it's been a, a barren spell for, for for him? And obviously, we all know he loves to be the yeah. centre of attention, and, and it hasn't been recently. Yeah, he will say no, of course, but I think. He wouldn't have wanted to have lost twice in a row in, in finals um, in, to the same player in successive weeks. But he, look, he knows, Michael knows his status. He knows what he has achieved and can achieve in the game. He doesn't need to prove that to anybody. But it may be nice to remind yourself every now and again. Yeah, the Premier League 8, was that an easy decision this so, year? Yeah. yeah, I think so, yeah. Once, you know, once Littler was, was, was a dot on the card, then yes, it was. I don't think realistically there are many players that can that can say that, you know, hand on heart, that they, they felt they, they deserved to be in it. I think Chris Doby had a good shout, uh, and I messaged Chris about it and had a conversation with him, as we always do with players who we, who we leave out who, who were close. Um, you know, and, and Chris was, was, in our, it was in our thoughts for a, a lot of it. Possibly still hadn't quite done enough the previous year, despite showing some good signs, and I think he can take a lot from his debut year in the Premier League. There's no doubt for me he'll be back in it again one day. He's a great lad, he's a great advert for the game and a very popular player perhaps hadn't quite done enough. Um, but I'm not sure that there are many others, unless you can tell me any, who, who, who perhaps would have deserved, felt they deserved a, a no, shot this Chris year. Chris was my only one, if I'm being honest, Chris would have been in, in mine, but look, I don't pick it. Yeah, he, yeah. Would have been, he would, he would yeah, have been yeah, yeah. in mine, but I think he was the only one that I think that had a, had a shot, if I'm being yeah. honest. Do you think we're close to a, perhaps a changing of the guard right now? We've got players that have had glittering careers, hmm. perhaps coming towards the end. We've got these youngster hungry youngsters coming through do you think darts is at this point where we're almost seeing a, another change in the guard almost when phil went that way as well are we close yeah, to that maybe i mean I've, I've said over the last couple of years when I've, I've talked to people who aren't as au fait with the game that sort of wright smith price and van gerwin was our kind of equivalent of federer and nadal djokovic and murray you know who dominated tennis for for five to ten years or whatever and i think that that cosy little quartet is maybe being threatened now 
You know, there was a period, there's been a period of time when they really dominated and, and they were the hoovering up trophies and, 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 you know, sharing the spoils between them. And, and I thought that was great for the game because there were some genuine rivalries and some really high quality matches and things like that. But it can't last forever and, and sport always moves on. You know, so as much as somebody else comes into form, somebody might drop out of it. But the great thing is you can always come back. So it just, it just puts the pressure on people to, to go back to delivering what they were doing before. Big rule change was announced as well, revolving the European Tour. Mm. I'm guessing you've, you've seen all the, the comments on, on social media. Some, yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, from a PDC point of view, can you talk mm. us through why that decision was made? Yeah, so we looked at it in the context of how we want to keep building the European Tour, which is, you know, the, the European Tour has come a long way over its pretty much decade of existence, and it's got a long, long way to go to hit the heights that we, that we want it to achieve. Um, it's got more countries to go to, it's got more prize money to offer, it's got bigger crowds to generate, wider broadcast. And we looked at the overall format and having two thirds of the players coming from qualifying tournaments we felt was just too high. You know, we felt we needed to make sure we were going to underpin a, 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 a quantity with a, you know, pretty much a guarantee of, of big names, marquee names, but also the players who are at the top of the rankings for a reason, because they are the best players in the world, while still keeping the door open for a lot of other players to qualify. Now there's still 10 players to come through the tour card holder qualifier. There isn't another tournament where 10 players can get, can get through. And there's 13 of those throughout the year. This isn't the door being closed by any stretch of the imagination. You know, if you're a tour card holder, you've got 47 tournaments per year that you're guaranteed to be in. So in respect of the opportunities to qualify for um, or, 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 or be straight in the main draw. So you've got plenty of opportunities. And I accept, obviously, it's gone from having 24 players qualify through the tour card holder qualifier and the associate member, et cetera, et cetera, to a smaller number. But nevertheless, there's still going to be a large crossover of players from the rankings and from the qualifier that would have got through anyway. So I don't think, I don't think, I think there's been a bit of an overreaction to it, if I'm honest. Um, you know, and I accept people like to see different faces, and that's great. Um, we obviously thrive on different faces coming through. It doesn't suit us if it's the same players doing the same things for years and years and years because people will get bored of it. So as soon as people start to do well enough, we want to open doors for them. And the opportunities are still there for players. Can you understand the frustration of some of the lower ranked players by the change though? Well, of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, why wouldn't you be frustrated if previously you had 24 opportunities to do something and now you've only got 10 or whatever? Then, yeah, of course you'd be frustrated. By it. But you have to understand the reason why decisions are made. You know, I saw, I saw uh, some quotes about the people who are making the decisions. Well, the people who are making the decisions are the people that are doing it for the benefit of the whole game and the whole structure and the whole sport. You know, everybody is governed by self-interest. A top-ranked player wants what's best for a top-ranked player. A mid-ranked player wants what's best for a mid-ranked player. A lower-ranked player wants what's best for a lower-ranked player. We want what's best for the PDC, which is the whole sport. And that includes the under-8s that are playing in the JDC through to development tour, the challenge tour, the women's series, the pro tour, the European tour, all the TV events, the World Series, the whole shebang, all the affiliate tours around the world. Because if they don't all thrive, the system won't thrive and the sport won't continue to grow. So every little component plays its part and it all has its place within the structure. Our job is to get the balance right. That yeah, was Vincent said it was made by a businessman. Oh, Vincent. Oh, <laughs> he hadn't said anything for a couple of days, so I wondered, I wondered when he was due to do another interview. There, there it was. Um, yeah. On that, obviously, I understand what you're saying, mm. but does this make the top 16 a very elite club? We have to be careful no. not to be over-protectionist, and we are very conscious of that. And, and hence, don't forget that the prize money won't always count on the order of merit if they were to, lo to yeah. lose early on in the tournament. So we are, we are conscious of that, and that is something that we will continue to review. You know, it's a, it's a position that other sports have been through where they've maybe been too protectionist for, for, for their top group. But we believe with the prize money that's on offer and the number of opportunities to win prize money, that there's still plenty of opportunities for people to break into that top group. What you wouldn't want to do is protect even fewer players. Yeah. You know, because then it does become a closed shop, particularly when you look at the, the prize money at the top end of, of, of the sport. You know, if somebody goes and wins the World Championship, they can put their feet up and, and know they're going to be in the top six or eight or whatever. You know, you, know, yeah. you, need, you need to make sure that there's always going to be uh, transition and fluidity amongst, that, amongst the rankings. Otherwise, it, it will just become stale. Obviously, I know you said you're going to monitor it, but does this make it harder for the chasing pack to gate right now 
get into that because of the way it is? I don't know. I mean, you know, you, you've asked about that. Nobody's really mentioned that we put another three quarters of a million pounds into the Players' Championship events. It's now a thousand pounds if you win your first match on, on, on the on, on, on the 30 Players' Championships. You know, so there's more money going into players' pockets on that side of it. We're not taking any money away on the European Tour. We're adding, we're adding more money on. In fact, if you look at the net, you're probably better off from a Players' Championship yeah. event than you would have been from a European Tour anyway because of the, 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 the expenses situation, you know, depending on where you're travelling from. But that, that's up to each individual player. I think, you know, the, the bottom line is that we, we wanted to balance out the routes into the tournament to reflect more the order of merit. You know, we're told the order of merit is our world rankings and it barely counts for any tournaments. Well, it counts for more tournaments now, as it probably should do, because if you're the number one in the world on the order of merit, by definition, you should be the best player in the world. So that has to count for something. It's just one of those things that if it had been like this from the start, that this would never oh, absolutely. have been an issue. I think absolutely. If we'd have launched the European Tour with this format, I think everyone had gone, I get that, no issue whatsoever. And I think you have to balance out as well the difference between the very committed fans who understand everything about the world number 97 and everything about the qualifying system and everything like that with fans who have more of a fleeting interest in darts and maybe only attend an event or watch an event on a less, fre a less frequent basis. You know, we have to cater for both audiences. Um, and I appreciate that's the difficult thing for people who know a lot more about darts than me and a lot more about the <laughs> rankings than everybody else and all of that to, 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 to understand. But I've said it before and I'll say it again, we're here to cater for the whole sport. Yeah, no, I think that's good. On the Pro Tours, obviously, like you say, the, the, the money ha has gone up. And yeah. again, fantastic now. What's the um, feedback on that been from players? Have you had much feedback? No, nobody said anything. I assume they're happy. I mean, uh, you would no. surely be happy if your prize money went up. Well, you, yeah. You'd like to think so. Yeah, I don't. Listen, I don't. By the way, I don't expect anybody to come up to me and shake my hand and thank <laughs> me. For it. It's not, that's not why we're doing it. You know, we're yeah, doing yeah. it because we think the players deserve it. We want to make sure. We, look, we've got 128 tour card holders, right? We want to get to a position where all 128 tour card holders can earn a living just from being dark professionals. We're not at that stage at the moment. You know, we're at somewhere we think somewhere between half and two thirds, somewhere like that who are probably existing yep. solely dart players. Um, but there's expenses, there's tax, there's managers' commissions, there's a huge amount of money to, cut, to come off that. You know, if we, we've, we've made changes to the exhibition rules this year to make it easier for players outside the top 64 to play in an exhibition in a way that's still compliant with their players' contract with us. You know, I mean, that's a, not something that I'd expect to generate any headlines, but that's been done again to help players who are in that middle to low echelons of the tour card system to help them earn a living. No, it's, it's interesting to, to, to get all these things, because again, people probably wouldn't, wouldn't know and, no, no, and, no, no, and under, no, no, understand all that. Look, I don't mind people commenting, because people only comment about stuff they care about. So yeah. the problem comes for me when nobody comments. That means nobody cares. So that's a good way of looking at it, to be fair. I, I like that. And obviously, the way Premier League tickets have mm. raced out the door, I don't think I've ever seen you guys put the graphic out Sold out. No, I hadn't. I queried it. So many. I queried it on our WhatsApp group. I said, "Why are we putting this out?" Can, <laughs> can, can I say the same? Because I was like, "I'm not having this." Yeah, I don't mind yeah, that. Yeah. So I googled the O2 because I was like, "The O2 never sells out." Yeah, yeah. And I couldn't get it a ticket on there, out. so I don't no. mind. I don't so mind saying that. This will be the first time we sell out the O2. It'll be the first time we sell out the Manchester Arena. I mean, arenas like Glasgow, Rotterdam, you know, the, the Dublin, the huge ones, yeah. the, the brilliant atmospheres. We sell, we've sold them out before, but we've never sold out the O2. And we've never sold out Manchester. Now there are. With, the, with the, the way we stage the event, if there are certain sightline restrictions where you can't see the stage in the upper tier. So if people go, oh, no, I saw some upper tiers, and Matt Porter said it was sold out, so he's lying. <coughs> I'm not lying. Yeah. You, know, you can't sell every seat. But to, for every seat that we can sell within those venues will be sold out, which is just phenomenal. You know, now, OK, let's, take, let's just say some of those people are only coming because they've cottoned on to darts since the World Championship and they're new fans. That's absolutely fine. Our job is to retain them. We've recruited them, now let's retain them. You know, so hopefully it's not just a one-year fad and this is, this is the, the shape of things to come. Yeah, no, it's tr tremendous and Blackpool going on sale, so there's mm. going to be lots of headaches there around that be, by the sounds of it. There will be a huge amount of disappointment. Although Blackpool is amazing, it's not the biggest place in the world. It's not, no, no, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should leave the Winter Gardens and go somewhere else. What do you think? No. Joking, <laughs> joking, joking. There's certain things you don't touch, mate. You know, joking, we would never do that. No. Um, obviously, the, the, the rumour mill's in, in full swing and like, like it always is. The way the World Championships went this year, and I'm guessing you're predicting even higher next year in terms of everything that, that's gone with it, are we close 
to an increase at the World Championships, going to, to 128 with the countries involved well, maybe, now? Maybe, maybe. I mean, it's something that's been discussed before, it's something that we've looked at. We have to be careful to only do that if it's something that will enhance the tournament rather than just do it for the sake of it. You know, it obviously costs a huge amount more money. Yeah. Um, may not generate a huge amount more revenue other than, than, than ticket sales because broadcast deals are in place, sponsorship deals are in place and things like that. But we want as many people as possible to enjoy the darts, whether that's in their seat at the arena or at home on their sofa. And we have to look at ways to do that constantly. So we're always evaluating and, and you know, that's something that, that, that is, you know, is a potential for the future, yeah. Yeah, no, you go to obviously because the way this year, these worlds went, Paddy Powers were incredible. Incredible, what, what, what an amazing the, Their brand, yeah, the, the branding they did on yeah, it, I've never yeah, seen anything yeah. like it on no, our no, championship. No, no, they just took it to they, another level. They took it to another level. They, were the, they, they, re, they rewrote the rule book, they were the blueprint, they were magnificent. They've got to do better next year, though, this yeah, year yeah, yeah. is the only issue. Just looking ahead before I let you go, because it's been a long day right. here. What, what are you foreseeing in, in 2024, the way the years started? If you had to almost redraw the PDC's roadmap mm. because of the way the year started? Mm. No, well, I mean, what we've had to do is make sure that we, we look our calendars set and we know what we're going to do for the year ahead. That's, that's, so that's fine. We just have to make sure that the responsibility is on us to maximise the, 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 the return and every event. And what I say by return is we have to maximise the ticket sales, we have to maximise the entertainment value, we have to maximise the in-event experience because people are coming to darts now in the same way that they're going to a festival or a World Championship boxing fight or a Premier League football match. And they're expecting to be entertained both on, by what's happening on the stage and what's happening off it. So our job is to put on a show from the moment you walk through the door or the moment you turn the TV onto the right channel to the moment that it finishes. So the pressure on us is, is on that, but the pressure on the players is to deliver to their best because they're going to be in front of more eyeballs now. There's going to be more and more people watching them under scrutiny to see how they cope against the new world champion, against the new 17-year-old protege. You know, there's, I, think there's, I think there's six world champions in, in the Premier League this year. And of those six, you know, there might be three or four of them who are thinking, I, I need to get back to where I was before. You know, because when I, where I was before, I was bringing a lot of money and I was uh, competing for a, lot, for a lot of trophies and things like that. So, and any player will want to maximise their return and they'll want to make sure they get invitations and they'll want to make sure they get to the latter stages of events. So in order to do that now, the competition is so fierce, they've got to be at their best week in, week out. What you said there about entertainment value, and you were there for Michael Taunt press conference earlier, where mm. he spoke about he'd like to see the one thousand and one like yeah. shootout tournament, a bit like snooker. We've yeah. seen Royal Rumble ideas, yeah. tournaments, and, and stuff like that. Is that perhaps the next thing? Not a ranking event, but have uh, people are going to love this? A, a non-ranked event that is slightly different and quirkier, maybe to yeah, capture I, I don't the, know. I think the casual. Needs, I think it needs a lot of thought because that doesn't capture the casual. Right, what captures the casual is them turning on to something and understanding what they're watching. If yeah. they watch something that's too complicated, they'll just turn off. Yeah. Because like, football's the most popular game in the world because it's one of the most simple games in the world. It's dead easy. You know, we're sat here at a rugby stadium. Rugby's quite a complicated game to understand. Yeah. And that's one of the issues they have when they're trying, trying to grow the game. 501, single in, double out. I know we do double in and in yeah, Ireland, yeah. one tournament, but 501 is understandable. If we start doing 1,001 or, I don't know, cricket or, or, or whatever, people are going to be turning on and going, I don't know what this is. You know, if, 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 I, I remember back uh, at Matchroom nearly 20 years ago when we were doing poker. There was lots of different formats of poker. And TV poker was standardised as Texas Hold'em yeah. because people started to understand what Texas Hold'em was. They didn't want Omaha, Hilo, all of those different yeah, yeah. versions. It was too complicated. Now, I'm not saying no, but I don't... I'm yet to see a compelling argument to say what 1001 or some other play it on a login board or whatever yeah, no, is necessarily going to bring to us that we haven't already got at the moment. No, it's, it's, it's an interesting because it has been brought up on social media quite a lot recently yeah. as well, which is, it, was a, it was a nice one. And then obviously looking at thing, I know we always ask you this, but I'm going to do it again. Yeah. The World Grand Prix, have we found yeah. anywhere in Ireland yet? Because that's, that, again, that's the one that always comes up. Are we going back to Ireland? Oh, we're trying. <laughs> we're trying. We're just, you know, we're trying. It's difficult. There's not many venues there. I, I, every time you, I, you interview me, you ask me the same question, I give you the same answer. If somebody knows <laughs> yeah. a venue, email him, find his details. <laughs> They're not hard to find. He's everywhere. Let him know. 
and then he can tell me. Yeah, it's just obviously because on the, when the calendar comes out, it's all just TV. Oh, no, it was yeah, TV, 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 yeah. it? And the poor fella from Leicester who tries so hard for his phones to be up every week, he goes, what are we doing, what are we doing? Yeah. Look, we're still evaluating our options. We know that Leicester can host the event really, yeah, really yeah, well, yeah. but the history of the event has been in Ireland, so we'll, we'll see where we go. Matt, absolute pleasure. Right. I know you've been a long day for Thanks you, so I appreciate your time. Anytime, no problem.